a very warm welcome to this special broadcast on Rajya Sabha television. We are at a very special location today. We are at uh, uh, ISTRAC, which is ISRO's telemetry tracking and command network in Bangalore. And joining me today on the show is a very elite panel, people who are responsible for the Mars Orbiter mission. Let me first introduce our guests on the show today. We have with us, of course, uh, Mr. J.D. Rao, General Manager, Indian Space Science Data Center. Welcome to the show, sir. We also have with us Mr. M. Pichaymani, uh, uh, Deputy Director, Spacecraft Operations. Welcome to the show. And also, we have Mr. Raghunath, Deputy General Manager, Mechanical Systems. Welcome to the show. It's lovely having you on the show here uh, today. And also, it's lovely to be a part of this program in your, uh, you know, in your uh, facility here that, that does so much as far as uh, space is concerned. Let me start with you, Mr. Pichemani, and talk to you about the Mars Orbiter mission on the whole. And uh, what do you think, are, or tell us, what are the main objectives as far as this mission is concerned? Uh, all of us know ISRO has already capability to build satellites, and it has uh, put satellites, many satellites in near-Earth orbit and to the geosynchronous orbit and for the near-Earth orbit for remote sensing and the resource monitoring purpose and in a geosynchronous orbit for communication purpose. Then naturally the next progression is to go to the interplanetary space. Already we had a successful attempt by launching Chandrayaan-1 yes. to the moon. So it is uh, it's a kind of near interplanetary experience but the real experience we are going to get only by sending this uh, mars orbiter mission to the mars planet itself which is really an outer planet away from the earth so by sending the isro is going to develop the necessary precision technology required for an interplanetary mission and the second one is the capability to sustain in interplanetary and hostile environment. Mm. So once this is uh, achieved, it's indirectly it is going to give absolute benefits in uh, making <coughs> satellites uh, for normal purpose uh, very with very uh, improved capability. Okay, okay. We're going to have improved capability. We're going to have precision te technology, technology yes. as well as far as this mission is concerned. Yes. Anything that you would like to add, uh, Mr. Rao? Yeah, actually, in this mission, we are carrying one methane sensor okay. to find the presence of methane on the Mars. Okay. And thereby, we can establish any life life is there on the Mars or not. That is also one of the important yes. things. Yes, it's extremely important, isn't it? It, it would be nice to know if we if you know that there is someone else in this universe along with us and that would be extremely crucial as well as far as this mission is concerned. But uh, let's move on now, uh, Mr. Pichemani, and talk about, of course, uh, some of the challenges that we have faced so far. Let's not forget uh, that this mission has completed 95, it's almost 95% complete. And, you know, we just got the last hurdle to, and the last, you know, you just have to get past the finish line now. What do you think have been the major challenges thus far and what do you expect in the future? In uh, the major challenges in building and controlling an interplanetary missions, uh, mainly it starts from uh, the, for example, uh, the satellites which is leaving the Earth and going towards the Mars over a 10 months period, it is going to travel a curvature distance of 680 million kilometers. But even then, the distance between the orbit of the Earth and the orbit of the Mars planet, it's approximately 65 million. So we have to go in a long distance. As we go away from the... Let, let me just interject. Why do we have to go in this long distance? I mean, why can't we go straight? Let yeah. Explain that to us. Yeah. So going uh, straight to the 65 kilometer vertically, it requires enormous amount of fuel. fuel. But by uh, doing this way, that is uh, creating an elliptical orbit segment between the Earth inner orbit. Just, just I'm going to interject once more, just to make things simpler for, for, for our viewers. Yeah. Elliptical orbit yeah. is nothing but an X-shaped orbit, isn't it? Yeah, I mean, it correct. goes like an X-shape. Yeah. Yes, yes, please continue. Yes. X-shape orbit. Yes. So this is giving an advantage of 
carrying less amount of fuel uh, because of that the weight of the mainly the satellite it's getting reduced and it is going to come within the our launcher that the vehicle capability our uh, rocket capability so which we will be able to launch and get an interplanetary mission the only the, uh, the the other side is it's going to be there in the space for a long time hmm. so so when you're talking about long time how how long do we expect the uh, you know the spacecraft to be in uh, in the interplanetary in, yes, mission in, interplanetary it, it mission. is approximately it is going to be for 300 days and uh, now that we have already completed uh, nearly 9 months now we are in the last month uh, september in few days ahead we are going to the the Ma mom the mars orbiter mission is going to go around uh, the mars planet and there we will be doing an important operation of capturing the uh, orbiter around the mars planet and that's the big day that all of us are waiting for, waiting isn't for it? it? 24th of uh, September. September. It's, just, it's not too far away, just, yeah. you know, just around the corner. Yeah. And it's going to be such a great day as yeah. far as India is concerned. Yeah. And I can already see the smiles on all of your faces. You're yeah. just anticipating and waiting for that to happen, yeah. isn't Correct. it? Let, let me come to you now, of course, uh, Mr. Raghunath, and talk about, you know, what could go wrong possibly. You know, the worst thing that could happen is that we could have a flyby. That means we've reached Mars. So, so technically, we'll be the fourth nation to reach Mars. So, I mean, it's, it's, it's great. It's a great achievement in itself, isn't it? Yeah, it's a great achievement. And more than that is there is a lot of learning lessons that we have taken. The learning lessons is we are able to communicate to the satellite. We are able to do all the maneuvers. Our ground segment has been <laughs> qualified because we have an ideas and what has been installed which has been proven that we are able to do all the communications that was required to the satellite. That, and, and that's that is very crucial, reason. isn't it? It's, it's extremely crucial. Explain to us what exactly this communication is all about, because it takes 24 minutes to communicate from here to the, to the spacecraft and then back. Explain to us how this process goes on and how crucial really communications are. Yeah. Coming to, because of the distance, it takes time. Yes. So that is, that is as simple as it. So it takes 24 uh, minutes to reach the to complete one to whole cycle to send the communication from if this I send center, a command, it goes, reaches, and comes back. It takes 24 minutes. Yes. So that is because of the distance. Hmm. Okay. Uh, but uh, it is not so simple. Like okay. I, I can communicate. When I have to communicate from a ground station, I should be, be exactly looking to that accurately to the position of the spacecraft. So that is the first experience that we have done. We have experience, and we are able to communicate. That was a good achievement that we had. You're talking about accuracy. I just want to ask you one more small question about accuracy, of course. What is the margin of error as far as, you know, accuracy is concerned? Is there a margin of error? No. We don't say a margin of error. Here, the error doesn't come. Yes. Okay. We say that it has to be within the limits. Okay. So what has been designed, these systems, what we have done is, we have to see to the exact location of the mm. uh, spacecraft within an accuracy of 15 milli-degrees. Mm. Mm. So, then only we will be able to communicate. Otherwise, we, we, there will be a, uh, the efficiency of our communication drastically comes down. Okay, okay. I'm going to come to you now, Mr. J.D. Rao. Okay, we've spoken about communication. Once the communication takes place, your team, you know, comes into the picture because that communication is then stored somewhere. Where is it stored and what happens next? What's that? Take us through that procedure. Yeah. This, once you communicate to the spacecraft, spacecraft will send the data to you. There are two types of data. One is health parameters, monitoring the health of the spacecraft. That data will come to Mr. Yes, Pichemane. We, we, will, we will touch upon that in just a bit, but yeah. uh, we, I will go to him. But, but do tell us about the other data. The other data concerned. is payload data. We have five payloads on board. What happens, once that it has reached Mars, all the payloads will switch on according to the requirement. Entire data will be recorded on board full all five payloads data and the data whenever that visibility is there over our ground station DSM 32 yes. entire data will be dumping it okay. Okay. the dump data first it will come to ISSDC Indian Space Science Data Center okay. there we will segregate into four files yes. five files rather yes. first file second file third file then this data straight away if I give to the scientist he will not understand what is the data a level of processing has to be done at our center so that, that we call it as a level zero processing in which that zero ones all this data will be zero one 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 like that data will be there. I will convert into engineering units and also what is the attitude of the spacecraft, 
what angle it is looking that to Mars. That information also I will add on to this. And this particular pack, what we will do is there are two things. One is this data is very precious data. If I lose a single bit, getting back is very difficult. Right. Yes. So entire data I have to store it forever. Okay. Entire, the entire data has to be stored forever and it is a state of the art technology. It is data that can never be lost. We'll talk about that on the other side of this short break. We'll talk about how ISRO stores this data and how it is foolproof and can never be lost or stolen. We'll slip into a short break in conversation with the scientists here at ISRO. Do stay tuned. We'll be right back. Welcome back, you're watching Rajya Sabha Television. Let me now quickly first introduce uh, another special guest that we have here on the show. We have with us Mr. L. Srinivasan, who's the Deputy Director, Ground Antenna Systems. And I'm going to come straight to you, Mr. Srinivasan. Let's talk about, you know, we were, so far, before we went into the break, in fact, we covered upon several of these subjects. Let's go back now to communications, because that is something that, you know, that, that you specialize in. Now, as far as communication is concerned, as far as I understand, the spacecraft or the Mars orbiter really sends out very, you know, low frequency signals, which, which, which are probably just whispers. How is it that you know that you track these whispers and how is it that you, that you divide it or distinguish between noise and these whispers? Explain the entire process to us. Okay, that's a very good question. See, basically, uh, the, um, uh, unlike uh, other uh, uh, low Earth orbiting satellites, which are around 1000 kilometers around that, around the Earth, so these are very far away. So the si signal what is going to be received from these spacecrafts are going to be very, very weak signals, okay? And almost it will get submerged in noise. So we need a kind of antenna which is a very large in diameter. So that means you collect more energy of the signal from the space compared to the, the noise level that is available. So what we use is, uh, unlike a uh, smaller dish an antenna which used for low earth orbiting uh, satellite, something like a a 10 meter diameter or a 7, 8 meter diameter antennas we use for that to receive signals from that. And uh, for this kind of uh, distances, uh, we have to use uh, something uh, uh, more than 30 meters antenna, 32 meter, 34 meters, or even sometimes uh, 70 meter antenna. So we have uh, a made uh, antenna of 32 meter antenna in our uh, Belalu complex. We call is, it as IDS. Is, is that state of the art? Yeah, it's a state of the art uh, antenna and it has been fully uh, developed and uh, realized indigenously. Okay. So they're very proud to say that it is a, uh, we, we could uh, realize that kind of antenna in, uh, indigenously. And uh, with all the set of our features, uh, for which is required to meet uh, uh, deep space uh, mission requirements. Basically, as I told, this again, the power that is getting transmitted from these spacecrafts, the, as I, the, you compare the distances of around 1,000 kilometers to something like 200 million to 300 million kilometers what our uh, uh, Mars Orbiter mission is going to uh, going, going to face and the end route traveling all these distances and the onboard of the spacecraft also they have made a special arrangements uh, we, unlike a smaller antenna they also have a dish antenna on board so that maximum power is transmitted towards the earth hmm. so that you know in, interesting that you brought up dish yeah. antenna let's 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 make it a little simpler now yeah. is the technology similar to you know to our DTH systems that we have at home where you know it takes a signal directly from from the satellite and that's yeah. how you know that's how we get cable TV at home yeah. in simple yeah. words in crude in a crude sense can I say that's what it is yeah it is something like you can have your, your DTH antenna you have you know a smaller antenna maybe about one minute one meter or even less than that uh, the, the there the whole idea is to make uh, the ground system much simpler so that you, every house you can put a smaller antenna of one meter or less than that you cannot put a 32 meter or 10 meter antenna for in each house. But what they do is the complexity goes on board. The satellite transmits very high energy and the distance involved is also very less. It is something like uh, 36,000 kilometers of communication uh, satellites. You, you uh, transmit more energy from spacecraft so that you optimize the ground a smaller dish. But uh, what happens in this kind of uh, spacecraft, the, the, uh, the uh, onboard resources are limited. The power generation, you, you cannot generate that kind of power, what is required uh, uh, for, uh, to have a smaller antenna. So with all this optimization, we try to co uh, complicate the ground. See, we can afford to make a 35 meter antenna on ground, but I cannot put a 35 meter antenna on the spacecraft. So we try to resource, we try to minimize resource requirement on board. But we try to make a bigger and bigger dish here, which is easier to manage in ground rather than in space. 
that is why we right. go for a bigger antenna and this antenna as you rightly pointed out is state of the art antenna and to distinguish the signal from noise so we have a specialized receive equipment okay. other than the antenna further yeah. to that we have to collect the energy so we have a very low noise amplifiers so these okay. amplifiers when you say you know it's something equivalent to your audio amplifiers or something where it adds its own noise to the signal so we okay. use a state of the art cryo cooled with a cryogenically cooled lna with a very it will give very low noise addition to the signal and that kind of right. system we apply and uh, that reduces the noise and uh, increases the signal to noise ratio so okay. with which we are able to decode the signal uh, and uh, that signal has to be digitally formatted and we will be sending that signal to the spacecraft controllers perfect, perfect. perfect. Yeah, right. so basically what we are talking about is you know how we have state of the art antenna here and how that, that particular data that is received there is sent to the team here which you, which you know analyzes that particular data I am going to come back to you Mr. Rao and talk about you know before the break we were talking about how this data that is received and stored you know in fact it, uh, it, it, it can be archived as well and you know you can access it at any point in time and you said it is foolproof explain to us how it's foolproof because in India we've seen several very crucial files important files and data going missing you know we've seen several of that lot, lots of that happening so explain to us how this system is foolproof yeah actually in the ISSDC we have hierarchical storage management system whatever data comes first my high availability storage around 150 terabytes of storage is there first copy will make it into the disk parallelly every two minutes this data whatever data parallelly in the SATA storage is there there also one more copy will be there automatic okay. system okay. and after that every 10 minutes this particular data will go to a big tape system is there okay. tape huh. so two tapes will be copying the data so we have we have backup you mean backup to okay and then after that once uh, one more tape also will copy the entire data and geographically some other place you will put it if something happens here also data should be safe hmm. and also we have vaults are there hmm. earth, earthquake proof fire proof everything proof very very huge in that one set of data we will store it okay manually. so you mean to say we have multiple copies of the same data so that you know one place is compromised yes we always have that data that can be accessed from somewhere else Correct. and how is this how is this data because I'm, I'm sure there's a lot of data I mean it's not it's not it's not like a computer hard drive but you know several thousand or several million computer hard drives so how is this data really accessed and how do you know where to get it from how, how is it labeled this actually the data whatever you are getting there are three different datas will be there one we call it as raw data as it is whatever you are getting from the satellite mm -hmm. then first level processing data will be there and second level processing data will be there so in my archive layer so we will be putting each today data first or, orbit wise you will uh, maintain the data files orbit number one orbit number two like that hmm. this orbit data will be stored as a raw data hmm. whenever I want to retrieve hmm. I have a software in-house uh, developed software using that if I give the orbit number as a key it will go to that particular day yes. and retrieves the data hmm. okay so that's what happens as far as the data is concerned and it can be accessed at any point at in any time. point now let me come to you mr. Pichaymani and talk about you know the kind of uh, teams that you have here in place and what is their specific role as such I mean I'm sure there are you know several people who are here who who work round the clock and to ensure that you know ISRO, uh, ISRO's work is, is a success all across so what are the kind of teams that you have in place here and what are their specific uh, or you know roles see this uh any spacecraft control it involves two segments mm. first segment is the spacecraft itself we call it a space segment yes uh, the space segment the spacecraft it is an integrated system with many subsystems like a control system sensor system power panel solar panel thermal all are there then comes the ground segment the ground segment responsibility is with the track yes. and we have uh, 17 antennas of 10 meter to 32 meter up to that so so many antennas are there spread across the globe with this uh, satellite uh, antenna we are trying to get the data uh, Mr. Srinivasan will explain why so many antenna and how these are received all those data. Okay. But let's once let's he has delivered the data to the control center, yes. 
the control center uh, in that the major teams are four teams are there one is the team responsible for okay, um, okay. tracking the okay. antenna and receiving the data and sending the data to the control center uh -huh. Uh -huh. then at the control center itself there is a control operation team okay i'll come to that then there is a team which is responsible to transport the data from far distance antenna to the control center through the existing communication link. There is another communication team is there. And the, the another team is led by uh, Mr. Raghunath, which is taking care of the mechanical aspects of the antenna to move properly and track towards the uh, satellite. Mm -hmm. These four teams are working. And uh, coming to this uh, particular control center team, and uh, this uh, interplanetary satellite like MOM, they have to be tracked continuously for 24 hours. And we have deployed people, uh, many people, at least front line, we have kept 10 or 12 people in the front line. They'll, they are 24 bar 7, they are continuously coming in a three shift operation. And uh, in the general shift, many seniors are assisting them in assessing the satellite health and uh, giving a plan for the operation to the team. Mm. And the operation team in touch with the seniors in the operation and mm. the, with the designers. Mm. So mm. it's a three shift operation, 24 bar 7 okay. in okay. here. Okay, in incredible. I mean, the kind of work I, I happen to I happen to be one of those lucky ones to be inside the you know mission control complex and see what exactly goes on there and what kind of work really goes on there. But uh, uh, taking off from what Mr. Pichaymani said, Mr. Srinivasan, uh, explain to us why is it that we require so many antennas and you know what is the real purpose to have all these antennas go working at the same time? Yeah, uh, basically, uh, the support given by a ground station mm. to a spacecraft. Mm or any spacecraft for that matter, is uh, three. One is telemetry, mm. tracking and command. We call it as TTC, mm. telemetry, tracking and command. Mm. Telemetry, uh, what we are, uh, 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 some time back we had discussed, that is receiving the tele housekeeping data, the health yes. of the spacecraft, yes. data from the spacecraft to the ground. Mm. So this data, the spacecraft is transmitting always its health. Mm. So this data has to be received in ground. Mm and using again a bigger antenna or whichever antenna is required for that particular mission, the data has to be received, formatted and sent to the spacecraft controllers who watch the data. Okay. And with that data, they decide how is the health of the satellite. Okay. And if they decide for some reason, they have to change something. Suppose the temperature is coming down, they have to switch on some heaters. So they have to take action. They have to in form of a command. Okay, so I'm, I'm, going, I'm going to come back to you now. How do you take action? Okay, now say for instance the, the spacecraft is so many million miles away. So how do you take action? It, take us through that process. What happens next? See, say for yeah. instance the ground yeah. team reports that something is wrong. Yeah. One particular component on the spacecraft is not functioning adequately or up to optimum level. Yeah. What is it that you do next? Now actually uh, the ground team is uh, receiving the data and sending to us. We, we, the control team, spacecraft control team, only really look at the satellite. So typically any satellite is having near about 3000 to 3500 parameters to monitor and say they are, the satellite is in good health. Good health. Generally, uh, if uh, one is the uh, defined operations, what we have to carry out on the satellite. And another one is the contingency operations. Uh, meeting the contingency operation in uh, satellites which are in below 1000 kilometer altitude, what we call low earth orbiting satellite. The communication time is in millisecond. But in the case of deep space mission, the communication is one major issue. Yes. So when we are reaching the Mars, when our uh, mom is reaching the Mars, the one-way communication takes 12 minutes. Two-way communication going to take approximately 25 minutes. Yes. So it's very difficult to get to understand the problem and take a necessary quick action. Mm -hmm. So this, as you asked, the challenge is to build a satellite which takes care of its problem on its own. Mm -hmm. What we call is autonomy. Mm -hmm. The major portion of the concentration was given in building the MOM satellite. Okay in developing the autonomy required uh, for the deep space mission, which understands its problem, 
takes care by configuring the redundant system on its own. Okay, and does so the mechanical that. system team, uh, Mr. Raghunath, play any role in any of this as far as uh, uh, the health is concerned and as far as, you know, doing something at the time of ill health? No, uh, regarding the mechanical system, as such is concerned is to see that it meets the required specifications. specifications. That's okay. uh, over and above, it is the team that takes it. Major requirement of the mechanical system comes is to build a system to meet the specification and also to monitor and see that the systems are intact. Okay. So okay. Okay. To that level, we, do, we ensure that. Uh -huh. If there is any issues, then we have to address it. But one thing is, once we are able to see a system which is in go to the specifications, it goes to the other. Okay, so you ensure that everything is handed over to the next team in perfectly fine condition. In operational. In operational condition. It, it's been in wonderful condition thus far because, you know, touch wood, Mr. Vishenathan, nothing has gone wrong so far. And that's incredible, isn't yeah. it? Yeah. Isn't it? I mean, yeah, it's <laughs> so far, nothing, no contingency. Uh -huh. so <laughs> no surprises, sir. No surprises. It's a quiet as per the design envisaged. It's a happening. And uh, even uh, we have uh, uh, loaded more fuel, like uh, anticipating any contingency, uh, which will be controlled by expanding some fuel in the control loop. So such things have not happened. We Great. are very happy to operate uh, such yes. a satellite, which is behaving the way we expected. Okay. Yeah, Mr. Rao, you had something yeah. to say, quickly. Contingency, suppose if any payload contingency is there, then what we have to do is that particular mode, if it is not working, you have to switch over to other mode. Yes. Those things, software, we have to change over to other modes and other, that's one thing we'll be doing it. Okay. And when the receiving data itself, there is a small contingency, then okay. we may ask for a redump of the same data, once again right. dump it. Okay. So like that, some of the hand in glove will go with the control center and doing that, get that precious data carefully downloaded. Well, nothing has gone wrong as far as the mass orbiter mission is concerned great operations are going very very well and it's a big pat on isro's back uh, that's all the time we have on this special broadcast i'd like to thank all my guests at this point in time uh, mr pichai mani l srinivasan jd rao and mr raghunath thank you so much gentlemen for being a part of this special broadcast and explaining all these complicated things in such simple language for you and me thank you so much for watching bye bye